Okay, Horace Cooper, you are going to talk to us today about the court system in America. Uh, you're on, and then we will all ask questions because uh, we're we're curious, and I'm I'm interested to hear about the federal, district, state courts, how this how this works. But not necessarily state courts, but they'll be a part a part of it. But the I see on him is that the, it's this U.S. federal district court, the U.S. federal courts of appeals, and then the Supreme Court. Anyway, you have this great chart. But Horace Cooper, thanks for being with us, and you're on. All right, great. I really enjoy having this opportunity, and I, I hope this proves to be something of interest to, to the audience as well. Um, we uh, all know this. We learn this uh, in either elementary or junior high, uh, that there are three branches of government in, uh, as part of the federal government. Everyone knows about the executive. That's where the presidential power is. Most people know about the legislative, and that is where Congress, which is a bicameral system that includes both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Today, we're going to talk about that third branch, the judiciary, or, which has the judicial power. The judicial power was authorized as part of Article Three of the United States Constitution. We're going to drill down because I'm under the impression that you guys have already had a really great conversation about the Supreme Court. So we're going to talk more about the federal court system more broadly, in particular the district courts and the appellate courts. Um, first thing I want to make sure everyone knows is uh, last September, that was only a couple months ago, we celebrated the 232nd anniversary of the Judiciary Act of 1789. It is one of the very first acts of the Congress of the United States after our U.S. Constitution was ratified. It created the federal court system, and it made sure that it was understood that our court system at the federal level was separate from the state courts. George Washington himself signed this law into act uh, into law uh, on 1724, 1789. It gave the federal courts the power and jurisdiction that all of the federal courts have. It has been modified, but in the beginning, this principle has been maintained. It allowed for the creation of specific and what's called limited jurisdiction. And all that means is, just like everybody, well, not everybody, but many people have gone to traffic court, you'll notice that at traffic court, the only kinds of cases that are handled in traffic court are the kinds of cases that are involving traffic violations. If you have a landlord dispute, you can't take it to the traffic court. Uh, this is the same with our federal court system. There are specific jurisdictional requirements that you have to meet in order to enter our uh, federal court system. And this is a concept that our founders understood and they acted upon from the very beginning. The Supreme Court, as defined by this uh, Judiciary Act of 1789, has what is called original jurisdiction. And that means that if your case covers the specific items that the Supreme Court has authority to hear, you can bring your case directly before the United States Supreme Court. Now, we're not going to, again, not going to focus on the Supreme Court because you guys have had a conversation about that. But it is these other courts that we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, there are 13 appellate courts. Twelve of them are the circuit courts of appeals. And the 13th one is called the Federal Court for the Federal Circuit. That distinction is because it's, it's, it's actually called the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. That 13th court has, like a traffic court or like a, a, a landlord-tenant court or, in, or a tax court, it has very special and specified jurisdictions. The courts, excuse me, the cases 
that are heard in the United States court, the cases that are heard in the United States Supreme Court, the overwhelming majority of them are appealed. That is, the cases didn't start in the Supreme Court, they were appealed. This is true with the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, and it's also true for all of the 12 other circuits. We don't start in these courts. We hear, they hear appeals from lower courts. So I'm going to first make sure everyone understands how the Federal Circuit, that's the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit works. These uh, uh, appeals are cases involving administrative agency decisions, like if the trademark office or the patent appeals board uh, gives you a response that you're not happy with, you can go to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Um, there's the U.S. Merit Systems Protection Board. If you're a federal employee and you are um, unhappy with having been fired, not given a bonus, not being allowed to take leave, and that board rules adversely to you, you can appeal to the federal circuit. These types of cases mean that it is a much narrower, much more limited. It doesn't have nearly the variety and the pace of cases that the other circuits do. You can't bring a criminal case there. You can't even bring a bankruptcy case there. If you have a dispute where you're a resident of Kansas and they're a resident of Texas, you can't bring it there. It's a much, much more narrower uh, area to operate. Whereas the other courts, the uh, 12 other courts, operate in a much, much broader way. First of all, to enter a district court, and these courts were created in the beginning when we first had the Act of 1789, that rule is now, if you're not suing over something worth more than $75,000, and you're not a resident of a different state, uh, the party that's the plaintiff, that's the one suing, or the party defendant, the party that is being sued, you can't enter the federal court system. Now, you can also use the jurisdiction of the federal courts for constitutional disputes. But in this case, as I say, this, these courts are much broader, far more of the activity that happens in our federal courts happen in these uh, particular uh, jurisdictions. Before there were appellate courts, we have 12 of them, and the 13th is the Federal Circuit, it used to be the job of the Supreme Court justices to go to defined geographical places that were called a riding circuit, and they would hear appeals from federal cases. When the Congress decided that they were going to modify this process and save the Supreme Court justices from having to handle this responsibility. That is how the circuit courts ultimately were created. Now, I could go on and on and on, but I, I think what we've got is a good background of how our um, – Courts came into being, what it takes to enter in, and what types of disputes are handled uh, by the courts. Okay, so is that a toss back to me, Horace? Yes, ma'am. All righty, that was great. And uh, we also have this um, graphic that I think we should put up, the judicial federalism, that would be great. Uh, Aubrey can put that up for us, that we can... We can be looking at that when I ask you my questions. And then I'm going to toss it to Tova and then to Jewel and Jordan and then to Kathy. And all any of the listeners who have questions, you can type them in and Kathy will get to them at the end here. So we all have some time. All right. So I'm going to ask very elementary questions for, say, the young students that are with us today. I am, from what I gather, to recap, there are 12 
federal appeals courts and the 13th and a 13th. Is that correct? Yes or yes, no? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. The 13th is very, very specific, a federal employee or copyright, yes. things of that nature. All yes. right. So now next week, we're going to talk about the state courts. And so, but I'm not clear about what you would take to, and we're looking here at the, I guess we're looking at the big squares today, the U.S. Federal District Court, and there are 12 of those. Why does it say 94 district courts underneath that, though? Because there are oh. 94 district courts, and the district courts are the courts that are, hold trials. They hear the disputes, and the rulings are made at those levels. And if you're not happy with those, you appeal to one the of the 12 circuit courts. Got it. Okay. Okay. Now I understand. So what cases, I, I didn't quite ca catch um, what cases go to the U.S. federal district court as opposed to, say, a state court. So tell us what type of cases do they hear in the 94 district courts around the country, the federal district courts? So if you have a constitutional question of any kind, you have to go to a federal district court one of those uh, courts, or if you have a dispute with a specific federal statute, or if the state of one jurisdiction, say Texas, um, is having a dispute with Georgia, say, over water rights for some strange reason, you would go into federal district court. If you are uh, just a regular person and someone hit your car and totaled your brand new Mercedes S-Class sedan that you <laughs> paid $109,000 for, and they totaled it, and they don't want to pay up, but they don't live in your state, you could file in federal court as long as the issue of dispute is greater than $75,000. Greater than $75,000. Okay, I did take a note that I did write down that you had said that $75,000. Give us it. So if, if you have a dispute with someone from a different state, it's not going to go to the state court. It's going to go, at, go to the U.S. Federal District Court. Give us an example of the other two. You mentioned constitutional and something else. Give us some specifics about the other two re reasons you mentioned. One, so one, let's one. say you are a rancher. And uh, the Environmental Protection Agency says that your cows are passing gas at too great a level. And they're going to fine you because this is an emission that, quote, is unlawful, according to a determination by the Environmental Protection Agency. You would say, well, wait a second. I know the EPA rules better than you guys do, apparently. But cows aren't covered. But you can't just simply refuse to pay the penalty just because you know you're right. You'd have to go into federal court, and you'd have to file against the Environmental Protection Agency. And that's because if it's a federal law or federal rule or federal regulation, your state government does not hear those disputes. But let me explain also, that's why if an uh, out-of-stater hits your nice brand new uh, Mercedes S-Class, you don't want the Kansas court where they live to decide the case, at least their founders didn't, because they thought that there might be some risk that the court, a state court in Kansas might be more favorably inclined toward the Kansas resident than, say, the New Mexico resident. So the founder said, no, no, we're going to have you go into federal court where our judges are going to make sure that their goal is to uphold the law of the land wherever they are and regardless of what jurisdiction that they live in. So that's the reason that if it's a dispute between people of two different states, you do it in a federal court. If, on the other hand, you have this complaint against the Environmental Protection Agency, again, you don't want the Kansas court to decide it, our founders thought. They said they wanted a neutral person, a federal judge, who would look at the law, hear your arguments, and decide on the basis of the facts at hand. 
not a court like a state court, they said, which might decide the matter on the basis of, well, our Kansas guy is our representative, and that EPA, that's from Washington, D.C., we sure enough don't like that. We have a system that our founders gave us that operates on a principle that professional, highly skilled judges will decide the disputes. Now, in some instances, you may request a trial and you get a jury. Again, even with a jury, it's the job of that federal judge to see to it that the jurors that are seated are going to be able to give a fair hearing. And you will find in many instances that it may be more difficult to seat a jury at the federal level than it might be at the state level. And that's because our system is wanting to make sure that wherever you are, if you enter a federal district court in Florida, in California, in Georgia, in Michigan, we're going to see to it that the disputes that are resolved there, there's a high degree of confidence that it wasn't biased, there was no preference, there was no favoritism. Okay, that's super cool. I have two more quick questions and I'll toss it to, to Tova. Um, uh, one is about appealing, but, but before we get to that, there are 94 district courts Obviously, how is that divided out? How, how do they decide how many courts each state gets and where those courts reside? So all of the courts are distributed throughout the United States, and they are on the uh, basis of um, every state is guaranteed one, at least one district court, and then uh, up to four uh, district courts. And of course, the District of Columbia has to have one, and then we have a few territories. If you have a very large population, you'd be able to get up to four district courts. If you don't have one, then you are um, um, going to only have one in your particular state. Now, American Samoa, doesn't, it's one of our territories, but America Samoa doesn't actually have its own federal district courts. So if you were to uh, uh, have a dispute that you want to take to federal court, it's going to be heard in Hawaii, or as an alternative, it could also be heard in the District of Columbia. Okay, very cool. So each state is guaranteed at least one federal court. And if you get right. more than one, it's basically that's based correct. on population, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, who makes that decision? So um, the courts don't regularly move. Uh, <laughs> um, so no, what I has mean, happened? I, mean, they're, they're I understand not, what you're saying. I, I hear you. I hear you. So yeah. what has happened is Congress occasionally makes a an adjustment over time. Um, we had a period of dramatic change in population uh, after the uh, 20th century started, and so Congress made some modifications uh, to the layout. Um, we've subsequently done a few in the last 35 or so years where we continue uh, to make uh, changes and adjustments. Those decisions are, in fact, made by the Congress of the United States, and they are, uh, it's a bill that has to actually be passed, and it is signed by the President of the United States. Um, there is an administrative court of uh, judges and their staff and advisors that often make recommendations. Okay, that is fantastic. This is very exciting. Okay, um, Tova, I am tossing it to you. I don't know what the, the listeners can see. Can they see Brady Bunch or just the... The, uh, the, we might kind of want to take that up and down a little bit off the, so people can see people. Are we on speaker? We're on speaker. So are we there? Are we, are we in speaker view or are we? Pardon? We're on speaker view. Okay. Can y'all hear me? I can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, so it's your turn. Thanks. Um, 
So I'm learning so much today, and I was wondering, um, I'm, did the founding, uh, did the founding fathers have differing opinions on the role of the federal court system or on the form of the federal court system, and how did those debates play out in our early history? Well, the uh, first Congress was heavily dominated by the Federalists. And so the um, Federalist Party, uh, many Americans know today about the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, then uh, the Federalists uh, overwhelmingly dominated the first Congress. And so uh, as a consequence, the um, discussions uh, were uh, often uh, vigorous. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, debate about how to refine measures, but you didn't see much of a breakdown because um, there wasn't this kind of partisanship. So there is a big difference um, uh, between how things are operating today versus what would have happened uh, in 1789. It would have been a lot more... Um, 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 unified. Now, it was not the case that it was unanimous. Um, um, nothing uh, is, there's no idea really in a nonpartisan environment uh, where things are completely and totally unanimous. But what it was is that there wasn't this idea that one option was going to advantage uh, the um, um, uh, one political party over the other. Now, in the House of Representatives, it passed actually without a roll call, but as I said, in the Senate, it, the vote was, I think, 14 to 6, uh, because, uh, again, you know, you don't get unanimity. What you get is a real vigorous debate and conversation about things. And there were some who had thought that it was important for the Supreme Court to hear as many cases as possible under the theory that um, they were created in place by the Constitution, and as a consequence, the greatest amount of trust and regard would be placed in the rulings and the decisions of that Supreme Court. On the other hand, uh, the prevailing view was that the Supreme Court actually isn't going to be able to handle every single dispute that ever comes. Um, we are a very litigious society today. But even then, there were issues of dispute. And in those issues of dispute, you needed a professional court to intervene, offer up guidance, and provide the kinds of clarity. And the founders initially thought that all we needed were district courts where you would hold your trial, and then we would have an appeal that would then go to an individual judge on the United States Supreme Court. I should say justice on the United States Supreme Court. If you weren't happy with that individual's rulings, then you would appeal that to the full Supreme Court. That isn't how we operate today, but that gives you some idea of what people were thinking when this act first came about. Wow, oh, thank you. That was very thorough and always, always interesting. Um, and then I was wondering, you know, the country's population obviously has increased tremendously since this system was founded. Um, I believe the population of the U.S. was 2.5 million in 1776. Now it's you know well over 300 million. Um, so as the population of the country uh, uh, grows exponentially, um, do you think the system you know, has, has the system changed at all? Does it need to change? And how do they handle, you know, the increased course uh, caseload that comes with an increased population? Well, we could probably use some more uh, district courts. Um, some people say that we could use double uh, the number of district courts that we have. Um, there is, in fact, a bit of a backlog. You're not able to go in and um, make a filing and then uh, a couple of days later have your trial. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you present an argument about an emergency, um, you're typically able to get a hearing. Um, one emergency that just came up is when Texas and several other states uh, sued uh, the Biden administration over the uh, um, planned uh, vaccine mandate. 
and they were able to get a court to issue an injunction. Um, that was an emergency uh, decision. It actually is not, and sometimes the media gets confused, it is not evidence that the case has been decided. Sometimes what a court will say is that in the event that this argument or this concern or this basis for coming to court is so serious, we don't want you to be harmed while we're taking the time it takes. So a, a really good example of that might be a case where a person is in a coma in a hospital, and the hospital makes some announcement that they've tried to do all that they can, and they're going to turn off the equipment on grandma. You could go into court, especially if you were a resident in another state, and you were making a claim about what the hospital was doing that has a value of more than $75,000, and grandma's life is, is priceless, you could go into court and say, hold on, hold on, they can't do that. They're breaking the rule. They're breaking the contract. They're breaking the law. You can make a number of arguments. What the court might say is, I don't know if you're right or not, but if I don't stop the hospital right now by issuing an injunction, we could have an irreversible outcome. I'm not saying, the judge will say, that you're right that uh, they're breaking the law, they're breaking the contract, or they're in violation of some rule. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying the consequences of us not issuing this injunction would be greater than the consequences of letting us go forward, uh, letting this not go forward, I'm sorry. So they would issue the injunction. That's what happened with this vaccine mandate. There's just an injunction. We'll find out when they actually have a real bona fide uh, trial or at least an appellate hearing where uh, trained lawyers will come in and make their arguments. And then three weeks, six weeks, could even be six months, we'll get a ruling. That is also a function of the fact that we could probably use more courts. We could use more district courts. We could probably use a higher number of judges on each one of the appellate courts. Thank you so much. Um, and then finally, what what system did the founding like? Did the founding fathers model this court system off of any existing system, or was it kind of an uh, entirely new legal invention? So our uh, court system. Our court system was part of this tripartite, if that's a fancy word, um, uh, uh, that our founders came up with where we divided government on the basis of an executive branch, a legislative branch, or uh, the judicial branch. In almost every other uh, system that had existed, um, the um, judicial branch was either a very, very attenuated small part of the government system, or it was simply subservient to uh, the decisions of the legislative. Um, it is um, hard for people to realize, but the power of a person that we call the president is a unique position in terms of how this our Constitution was developed. Typically, the most influential, the most powerful person in the community was the prime minister, and that prime minister was uh, head of the legislature, and the legislature answered all the questions about policy, what rules, what regulations, etc., uh, were going to be in place. And in, in uh, the UK, the United Kingdom, for instance, uh, there was a long tradition of the uh, parliament being able to simply overrule the determinations of the court system. Our system is extremely unique in this regard, um, and it is unique precisely because that tripartite, that splitting our powers along three ways was intentional as a means of creating competition among them and more, moreover, 
the most important thing, and people forget this, this was a way that our founders wanted government to work so that individuals would not be abused by their own government. Instead of a whole long prescription, a written list of all of the kinds of things that the government will never be able to do, and who could ever imagine all of the kinds of things that you don't want government to do? We might agree on 10, we might even agree on 50, but could we agree on them all? And what happens when one of the ones we didn't agree on comes about, and you are told, no, no, it's not on the list. Our founder said, if we have this competition among these three of something very, very unique, you'll end up with a mechanism that is more likely to have your specific freedom, your specific liberty not undermined. We're going to require whatever this new law is, it's got to be passed by both bodies of the legislature. If it does pass both bodies of the legislature, it can be vetoed by the President of the United States. If he signs it, you can still go into federal court and you could actually have the uh, ruling, the, excuse, a ruling where the case says that law is unconstitutional. In every way possible, our system was originally created to make it less likely that an individual is going to have his or her liberty or freedom abused by our national government. So that's why it's unique. Now, a number of places, including the United Kingdom, have adopted a model similar to the American one where their courts now can be seen as courts of final review or uh, as we would say, when the court makes the decision, that's the end of the case. That's great. Of course, you're just so exceptionally uh, clear and uh, boy, so thank you for your wonderful questions. They're very, always very good. Time. I hope y'all can hear me because when I'm myself, I look like I'm on Mars. So I'm having a lot of the, <laughs> the internet issues, perhaps. Can y'all hear me? Okay, uh, Jewel and Jordan, you're on. Hello, okay. another great discussion about the courts. Thank you very much for all the information. Um, our, our government is pretty interesting and it's in the way it works. Um, we've been studying now for quite a while. We've been on the chat for not quite a year, but for a little bit. We came on after um, it was Tova and Dakari and then Jordan and I, Jordan and I started in the chats maybe around March. Um, and we've really gotten to look at many of the facets of the United States government and now we're doing a deep dive on the courts. So between the, the district and the, the district court and the Supreme Court is the only check on the Supreme Court on constitutional amendment. Okay, so um, the uh, founders absolutely did not want every single um, branch of government to have absolute power. They absolutely wanted to make sure that there was still some way of responding. And so, even though I called our Supreme Court the court of last review, or the, when the decision is made, that is the decision, that's actually not entirely accurate, um, because you are allowed to have a constitutional amendment, and that amendment um, can override a decision. Uh, famously, uh, the Dred Scott decision erroneously said that our Constitution uh, created and treated uh, people as some people as property and some people not as property. Um, it took the 13th Amendment to overturn that determination and uh, make it possible uh, with the 14th and the 15th to restore many of the rights and privileges that all Americans were recognized to have that our uh, 
Supreme Court had ruled in the Dred Scott decision didn't apply to some particular people who happened to be living in the United States. Uh, but there are other modifications or techniques that you could do. Uh, one is that as members of the Supreme Court uh, change, maybe they retire, maybe they die, you put new people on, and you can take some of the similar disputes to the newly constituted court, and you may end up getting a different ruling. Um, there has been a significant controversy since 1973 about uh, abortion and how uh, the rules of our Constitution are to apply with regard to regulation of abortion in the various states in America. Um, at various points, it, this case started in 1973, or at least the final decision called Roe v. Wade happened in 1973. It is now 2021. Um, there are two big cases pending before the Supreme Court, and we are likely we are likely to see a ruling sometime before the summer of 2022. So it's not exactly uh, it's not exactly 50 years later, but it's pretty close. You might end up seeing a ruling in which the Roe v. Wade decision is dramatically modified. Um, there are some asking that it be overturned altogether. Another technique might be adding new members to the Supreme Court. Uh, in the Roe v. Wade case, the decision was seven to two. You could imagine a case where you add seven more justices to the Supreme Court, and then you could have a nine-seven decision. A lot of Americans are very unhappy about that particular approach. Um, one president, uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he was very unhappy with how the Supreme Court was dealing with a number of his legislative initiatives, he came up with the famous court packing plan. And he had a plan that it required a mandatory retirement for members of a certain age, a replacement of every member over a certain age, and an increasing the overall size of uh, the Supreme Court with the vision that all of the new people that got appointed in his term would very, very likely rubber stamp his particular agenda. The American people flatly rebelled against this. Yes. Well, you're, this audience may or may not know, um, President Joe Biden has a commission asking the same question and offer, getting ready to offer uh, recommendations because there are a number of uh, Americans, uh, we call them progressives, but there are a number of Americans who are highly critical of the present Supreme Court, and they would like to see that though, that court be modified with new members so as to minimize uh, the likelihood uh, that uh, the rulings that they're seeing can continue. Uh, there is uh, still yet another way uh, that uh, you could try to influence the outcome. Uh, there is a package that's already being uh, pursued that would uh, change the recusal requirements. Now, recusal sounds like a big, complicated word. It merely says that if I'm going to benefit from a particular case, I can't be the judge deciding on that case. And uh, the uh, Supreme Court of the United States decides its own rules for recusal. And so you could modify the recusal rules in such a way that instead of having a nine-member court decide a case, maybe only seven can decide the case because the other two have a conflict. Maybe only five could decide the case because four have a conflict. So there are mechanisms that you can use, and I'll give one more final one. Uh, you can uh, modify uh, what types of cases must automatically be appealed to the Supreme Court, whether the parties ask for it or not. And that is a mechanism where you could try to make the Supreme Court have to keep hearing cases. A variation of that is you could actually create a special new court, like the patent court, like the tax court, that would only hear disputes of the kind that you're interested. Maybe you would have a new 
abortion court. And every time a ruling comes down from the abortion court, it would get appealed uh, to the Supreme Court. So the, you're not powerless in the outcome. There are a number of options. And again, that's precisely because our founders wanted to make sure that the government could not, the national government couldn't run amok over the liberties and freedoms of individuals. Very interesting. The court definitely has a lot of power, but there are certainly ways in which to check that power. I have one more question before Jordan, Jordan asks you some. Um, have there, besides, um, besides issues around the Civil War, um, around slavery, has there ever been nearly violent or, or volatile disputes between the district courts and those rulings being overturned as it, as it went up? Uh, give me a little bit more clarity on what you're asking. So uh, if, has there been any cases where a judge ruled <clears throat> about being in an appellate court, it went above that court and it was overturned or vice versa? Has there ever been then a volatile dispute between those two heads? Okay. Um, uh, here's a very, very interesting story. Um, the very creation of the Judiciary Act of 1789 is also the very first act where the Supreme Court issued its power of judicial review. In this case, Marbury had been given a commission. He was appointed and confirmed to be a judge under the Judiciary Act of 1789. And this happened after Adams was no longer president and Jefferson was president. There's called the, uh, uh, the lame duck period, which is simply one president is technically in power, but the other president is going to be in power. Now it's a much shorter period. We hold our elections in November, and in January, our presidential elections are held in November, and in January, we have the formal ceremony where we, ha we um, recognize who the new president is, and he is sworn in. That period used to be almost five months, where there was this period where you were no longer, you, you had lost the election, but you could still be president for another multiple set of months. In this particular case, Marbury ended up being named to a lower court judge position under the Judiciary Act of 1789. When that ruling, uh, when that determination was made, President Jefferson said, no, I will not allow you to hold this position. These positions are all being filled up. While I'm not around yet, I haven't uh, been confirmed, there hasn't been an inauguration for me, and therefore I'm going to end up with all of these Federalist judges and I won't have any positions to fill. I refuse to allow this to take place. And as it happens, Marbury didn't get uh, uh, to go to court, go to his own courtroom until a couple of days after Jefferson had become president. And Jefferson said, nope, you can't do it. So Marbury went to federal court and said, I'm not allowed to be a judge. I was uh, under the terms of the Judiciary Act of 1789. I met their qualifications. I have been appropriately appointed. I've been named. Here's my certification. I got a letter, and it says you are this, and all I need to do is be sworn in, and Thomas Jefferson isn't allowing me. And the lower court said, yep, yeah, you're right. This isn't fair. This isn't appropriate. You deserve the right to be appointed. Thomas Jefferson famously announced, even if, even if you announce that he is allowed to have this position, I will not allow it, and you can't make me. And so the United States Supreme Court was in a bit of a quandary. On the one hand, 
here you have a lower court having made its determination based on the facts, and the evidence was pretty straightforward. He got the letter. He was actually appointed. The Congress had voted. Everything that was necessary for him to occur had occurred. The only thing was that he was being blocked from going actually to his courtroom to operate. But if we rule in his favor, won't President Jefferson just simply ignore it? And if he does that, won't everybody else ignore us? There are a lot of big disputes. This one isn't even that big. We don't have the power to make people do things. The way we operate is we have to get people to agree that our authority to make the ruling is um, legitimate. And so here's what they ended up doing. They ruled, yes, the Congress um, had, in fact, appointed Marbury. Yes, Marbury had, in fact, received his commission and was otherwise eligible to serve on the court. But no, Congress could not uh, allow for a direct appeal that bypassed the circuit court for the Supreme Court itself to decide this decision. And they struck down that provision of the Judiciary Act of 1789, the first ever act of judicial review. And that put Thomas Jefferson in a real quandary. On the one hand, Marbury didn't get to be a judge, but on the other hand, he wasn't allowed to defy the Supreme Court. And from that point forward, Everyone has acknowledged that if the Supreme Court declares an act unconstitutional, even a small part of that act unconstitutional, that part of an act is therefore no longer valid, no longer void, and that can't be overturned unless you go through many of the examples that I provided about what to do when you're unhappy with the outcome of the Supreme Court. Wow, that was did not expect all that, but wow, that's amazing. So interesting. Thank you very much. Our court system is an amazing, amazing and remarkable system. Um, the founders gave us a gift. Um, they gave us this court system. They gave us a Congress. They gave us an, uh, an uh, executive. They gave us a constitutional operating system that it's up to us, as Benjamin Franklin said, we have a republic if we can keep it. And there is a lot of vigilance that's needed on our parts to make sure. It's a lot. It's very easy to criticize. It's very easy to gripe. Uh, but it's a lot harder to operate and let the real strength of our Constitution have its way. Even if we're not happy with the specific policy outcomes, understanding that we're operating in a decision uh, matrix that's extremely just and extremely fair. It's like knowing that your mother and father, when they give you an answer about something, you know, even if you don't agree with it, you know they did it for your own best good, your own best interest. And when you compare that with decisions that might be made by the Boy Scout leader or the baseball coach, where you aren't always confident of it, our founders wanted to make sure we have a system, and in particular our court system, that operates in a way that we can trust that these decisions and these outcomes are valuable and they are valid. Uh, wow. I just, uh, <laughs> I just looked at the time here, and I think, uh, Kathy, do you want to run to some audience questions? I mean, he answered a lot of my questions I was going to ask with – everything you said anyway. You're muted, Kathy. Yeah, that would be great. Oh. And thank you so much, Jorn and, and Jewel, for those wonderful questions and Tova and Janine. Um, you know, we've had a couple of questions from the audience course on common law. Do you want to talk real quick about, you know, what your definition of common law is and how it fits into the court system? Sure. So our federal system um, was intended to operate where we use um, the disputes 
of the various cases, the outcomes of the various cases, primarily to set precedent. So we had 19 different lawsuits involving this particular type of issue. When the 20th time that this case came about, you could look at it and see, ah, oh, yes, that's how these kinds of decisions were occurring. And so many thought that it would be very simple um, for us to understand and apply uh, the precedents. The problem is that when the courts first started, you didn't have any federal precedents. And so the rule was that what a district court would do is it would scour the common law or the precedents or the rules that the state courts in its jurisdiction uh, was using. So you have 13 states. If your dispute took place in Florida versus your dispute having taken place in Massachusetts, you might end up seeing a different rule apply. Now, what you could do is if you are unhappy with the, the uh, Florida rule, you could appeal to the circuit court. Now then, in the beginning, that meant that one member of the, uh, one justice of the Supreme Court would hear your appeal. Typically, typically, if the ruling turned on the application of common law in the state of Florida, the justice was unlikely to rule against it because overturn it, because he would argue that this isn't a case of the law being misapplied. This is simply a case of in this state, they've always done it this way. But if you were unhappy about that, then you could appeal to the full United States Supreme Court, and then they might issue a ruling if they decided to take the case, and that would apply in all 13 states. Common law normally was the rules that the local jurisdictions operated from. In the England, you had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of understanding of how the rules operate. In America, our federal courts initially had none of these, and they therefore had to rely upon the local rules of the given specific states. Well, thank you, Horace. That was great, a great answer. And Jonathan Nash asks, what has been the biggest, most impactful change to the judicial system itself since the Founding Fathers' vision created it? Well, I think um, I, I would argue the very ruling in Marbury versus Madison uh, has been the most transformational, but I also would argue has been the most beneficial. Um, nowhere in the Constitution does it explicitly say uh, that the Supreme Court is going to have the power to strike down an act of either the executive branch or an act of the Congress or an act of a state government or any other actor, and yet um, – we now take that for granted, and it has proven to be a very, very efficacious benefit. Okay. And then John Chambers asks, I'd like him to speak to the fact that the Federal Court of Claims does not have a jury. This appears to violate the Seventh Amendment. Can you explain how it is not? So, um, if your dispute is between... Uh, the way our Constitution operates, if your dispute involves a matter in which your life or liberty are at stake, you are guaranteed the right to have a trial. If it does not, you are not guaranteed a right, but you may be granted such a right. In um, landlord um, and tenant court, you'll often see that there are no trials that have jurors, even though there are trials. In traffic court, you'll see that there are often no jurors, even though you're having a trial. Um, the federal circuit is really no different. Now, let's be clear, the federal circuit is an appellate court, and we typically aren't asking for a ruling over what's called the facts of the case. We're only applying the law in the case, and a dispute with the EPA, a dispute with the Merit Protection Board. We've heard all the facts already, and we're just asking, was the law appropriately applied? Even if you've been convicted of murder, 
and you're not in the federal circuit, you're in one of the courts of appeals, you're still not getting a trial at the appellate court level, and you're certainly not getting one at the Supreme Court level. Great. Well, I think that we are right at time. Um, and we just thank you so much for being on today. Uh, we thank all Wait, of our- Wait, I have a question. It's Janine. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Horace, uh, you were telling the story of Marbury versus Ma Mar Marlboro, Marbury versus Madison. And of course, John Marshall was the Supreme, was the Chief Justice at that time. I'm just answer very, 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 very quickly. Uh, what I wasn't clear, I've heard that story so many times and I love it, but I wasn't clear about what John Marshall or the Supreme Court ruled that they had done wrong. Did they, they didn't, uh, so that, so that it wasn't upheld. They didn't go through the court system the proper way. Is that what you said? So, um, the Supreme Court itself is a court of original jurisdiction, but almost all of its cases are, that it hears today in 2021 are cases of appellate jurisdiction. That is, some other lower court heard all of the facts and then you appealed to uh, the Supreme Court for final determination. In this particular case, the Supreme Court was being uh, was told that this dispute had to be decided not as a matter of appeal, but as part of the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. In other words, any time a dispute like this were to come about, any time the Supreme Court would have to stop what it's doing and focus on this. And the, uh, what Marshall said was, I've looked here at the Constitution, what it says are the issues uh, that can be brought um, first in the United States Supreme Court. And it says nothing about, um, I had an appointment to be a judge and the president won't let me. That is a dispute. It's a federal dispute, true enough, but that's a dispute that has to be handled by a lower court. Ah, and they didn't go through the lower court first. They just took it to the Supreme Court first. That's right. Got it. Okay, I really, I, that, thank you. I'm sure that, that's, that's really fascinating. And I'll just make a note that, that they certainly don't abide by that now because when presidents have two months left, they're still trying to, get, you know, I think we had a Supreme Court justice that was, that was uh, during that sort of lame duck oh, yeah. period. And a yeah, lot of judges but, but, now are done through the lame duck That's consistent period. with what Marshall said. That's How's consistent that? with what Marshall Because Marshall, the, the Marshall ruling said, yes, Marbury, um, um, if a judge had appointed you, um, excuse me, if the Congress had appointed you, the president had named you, and the Congress had confirmed you, that's fine. They can do that even two days before the inauguration. Uh, did you receive your documents? Yes, you received your documents. They're valid. The only thing we're saying is it was unconstitutional for you to be allowed to bring this case to us without having a lower court here. Ah, okay. See, I think I just thought that really needed to be cleared up. And I'm, I'm so glad I we understand that now for numerous reasons. Um, thank you so much. Horace, right. and I'll turn it back to Kathy because... Uh, she was very eloquent there, but I, Taurus, you're amazing. Gosh, what a treasure having you on the show today, as well as Aubrey and Tova and Julian Jorn, um, just a great group here today and Elizabeth. So thank you everyone. So Kathy, I'll turn it back to you to say a goodbye to the rest of the, the co-host panel here. I'm sure would love to say goodbye as well. Well, thank you. And I just want to remind everyone that if you enjoy these Zooms and get a lot out of them, you can be a sponsor of our Zoom. You can go on our website and click donate. And don't forget our auction that launches on Thursday, November 11th, a lot of great items. And you can go on the website and, and click uh, and be looking around for what you want to bid on when bidding opens uh, Thursday, November 11th, 8 a.m. Eastern. So, uh, Jewel and Jorn, would you like to say goodbye? Yeah, our yeah, tablet just started spazzing and <laughs> coming up with notifications, so we couldn't hit the mic. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great show. Learned a lot, uh, so much. It was, it was yeah. so interesting. So I, I really appreciate yeah. your uh, your enthusiasm towards the topic. Made Definitely. it very enjoyable for us and very informative. Happy to help out. Is Tova still on? She left. She okay, signed Elizabeth. off. Aubrey, do you want to say a quick goodbye? Thanks so much, Horace. It's great to be with you all. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Yes, thank you, Horace. You always do a great job of putting it simply so that we can all learn together. <laughs>
Great job. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And Janine, any last parting words? No, I think I think it's good. Except except everyone, if you missed the show and would like to share this with um, a friend or family that you would like to hear this the show, it's all available everywhere. Website, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcast. Uh, it's under Constituting America, I believe. So you can go go find it, and listen to it there, or on our website in archives. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.